For over 50 years, the Juno 2 rocket has graced the U.S. Space and Rocket Center space line. Like all the artifacts at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, it has a story to tell. And this is that story. When the Army is directed to fire probes toward the moon, the mighty Jupiter is ready to fill the need for a more powerful rocket vehicle. It becomes the first stage of the new carrier rocket called the Juno 2. The Juno 2 rocket was a satellite launcher developed in 1958 by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency at Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. A pioneer and explorer, the Juno 2 was critical during the early days of the space age in helping humankind learn more about the space around our Earth. After the success the Army Ballistic Missile Agency had in launching America's first satellite, Explorer 1, the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration turned to the Army Ballistic Missile Agency's rocket team, led by Dr. Werner von Braun, to launch larger, more robust satellites even further. By using the pre-existing Jupiter rocket as the first stage of the Juno 2, this allowed for a shorter development period. Even so, the Juno 2 needed to go further and lift much larger payloads than the Jupiter had ever been tasked with. This meant that the Juno 2's first stage would have to burn for much longer than the average Jupiter rocket would. To allow for the increased burn time, the propellant tanks were elongated just slightly, giving the Juno 2 approximately 20 seconds more burn time. Always pragmatic, Dr. Von Braun was candid when asked about the Juno 2 and any future rocket's limitations. Well, is, is there in theory any limit to the size of the object that you can hoist up there? No, so obviously uh, the only limitation that I know of is the taxpayer. <laughs> For the upper three stages of the rocket, they chose to use the same configuration that was developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, for the Jupiter C slash Juno 1 rocket that launched Explorer 1 and Explorer 3. Now we, we have the cluster assembled. We see the, the cluster of 11 rockets first, and then three rockets that fits inside the group of 11, and then the single rocket, which constitutes the fourth stage. And on so, top of which goes the and payload. And then we put the payload on top of this. The scientific instruments go up here. The first test of the Juno 2 rocket was on December 6, 1958. The scientific payload was the Pioneer 3 probe intended to fly past the moon and then into a solar orbit. This is the assembled instrumentation, including the battery, power supply, transmitter, and associated electronics. Here is an assembled payload. During the early portions of the flight, the entire high-speed rocket cluster is spinning. By spinning the cluster, the rockets come shooting out of this tub and maintain their direction uh, quite accurately. Well, this is roughly analogous then to the rifling in a rifle barrel. Is that the same right? sort of thing, yes. However, problems arose when the first stage of the rocket cut off prematurely due to a propellant depletion circuit malfunction, preventing the probe from being able to leave Earth's orbit. Even so, the probe helped validate data from Explorers 1 and 3 to scientist Dr. James Van Allen proving the existence of a second radiation belt around Earth. Then on March 3, 1959, NASA tried again with the Pioneer 4 mission. This mission was successful, with Pioneer 4 becoming the first U.S. probe to escape Earth's gravity. As well, it was the only successful lunar probe launched by the United States till 1964, with the probe flying within 36,650 miles of the lunar surface. Pioneer 4, the Army-launched space probe, speaks to Earth from 400,000 miles in space, proving the feasibility of radio communication with vehicles traveling in the void of the cosmos. After Pioneer 4, NASA chose to use the bigger Atlas Able booster for lunar efforts and only use the Juno 2 for Earth orbital launches. The next Juno 2 launch was going to be the sixth Explore mission, launching a 91-pound scientific payload into low Earth orbit. On July 16, 1959, the Juno 2 rocket engine ignited. However, a shorted diode caused loss of power to the guidance system. Launch Control had no choice but to destroy the rocket only five seconds into flight. In spite of the fact that Missile 16 came to an untimely end, we have its twin underway. We're planning to, to another shot of this same payload and the same missile in two months, which we hope will 
accomplish the scientific mission that was intended for this. Work began on preparing the Explorer 7 mission. In the meantime, the Juno 2 had another failed launch when trying to launch the Beacon 2 satellite. Finally, on October 13, 1959, Explorer 7 was ready to launch. I'm standing on a launching pad at Cape Canaveral. Behind me is a Juno 2 missile, a modified Jupiter. Sometime tomorrow, come rain or shine, this missile will attempt to loft a satellite weighing more than 90 pounds and put it into orbit. It rose from the launch pad in Cape Canaveral, Florida and successfully entered low Earth orbit. It transmitted data continuously through February 1961. And as of 2023, Explorer 7 is still in orbit. However, this mission proved to be bittersweet for the U.S. Army, as a new chapter in the space age was about to begin. It also marks the end of the Army's career in space. For last week, the President transferred Von Braun's Huntsville team and their Saturn project to the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. If Explorer 7 is to be the Army's last salvo in space, it is perhaps a fitting epitaph. The Juno 2 rocket would be used five more times by NASA, with only two of the launches successfully getting their satellites into low Earth orbit. By 1961, other rockets had been developed that were proving to be more reliable. The Juno 2 was relegated to history, with the remaining rockets being put on static display at museums and NASA centers as a reminder of the pioneering accomplishments the rocket made. The U.S. Space and Rocket Center's Juno 2 rocket recently underwent restoration work and has been returned to the Rocket Center space line, where it will continue to inspire the pioneers and explorers of the future. <laughs>